meeting house. Uh, delighted uh, to have all of you here this evening on a beautiful Cape Cod uh, evening. Uh, I'm welcoming you not only on behalf of the friends of the Toro Meeting House, uh, I'm the chair, John Marksbury, and the Truro Public Library, and we're delighted to be partnering with the library this evening on this program. Uh, Stephen Kinzer is an acclaimed writer and journalist, and we're very honored to have uh, Stephen with us this evening. Uh, uh, he uh, has been the, previously been the author of uh, The Brothers, Reset, Overthrow, and all the Shaw's men. Mr. Kinzer was, uh, served as the New York Times Bureau Chief in Turkey, Germany, and Nicaragua, and as the Boston Globe's Latin American correspondent. A resident of Truro and Boston, he is currently a senior fellow at the Watson Institute for International Public Affairs and writes a column on world affairs for the Boston Globe. In 1998, Columbia University bestowed its uh, Maria Moore's Cabot Prize on Mr. Kinzer. It's the oldest prize, international award, in the field of journalism. And it was set up to promote, uh, to honor journalists in the Western Hemisphere who promote inter-American uh, relations. Um, tonight's, uh, as I mentioned, tonight's talk is sponsored by the Truro Library. Uh, I'm also uh, pleased to tell you that Mr. Kinzer will answer questions after his talk. Uh, now I'm very pleased to welcome to the stage Stephen Kinzer, the author of The True Flag, Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, and The Birth of American Empire. Everybody, listen up. Pops is going to talk on stage. We have never had a president before who was destitute of self-respect and of respect for his high office. We've had no president before who was not a gentleman. We have had no president before who was intended for a butcher, a dive keeper, or a bully. Now, these words were not written this week. <laughs> That's Mark Twain talking about Theodore Roosevelt. They are the marvelous, marvelously matched antagonists in uh, the story that I, I tell in my new book. When you write a book, you're uh, usually living with the people uh, that you're writing about. And uh, it was very unpleasant when I had to write my book about the Dulles brothers because they were unpleasant car companions. But Mark Twain and Theodore Roosevelt were different. They, they really are fun characters. In many ways, very different. So Theodore Roosevelt, as you all know, was a spoiled, rich kid who uh, had private tutors and never went to school. Liked to play with little toy boats in his bathtub and watch the sea outside of his estate on Oyster Bay. He got transfixed by these fantasies of navies and fighting men. He came to become fixated on war. He believed that war was the only noble pursuit for a man or for a nation. Uh, I found wonderful letters in my research uh, trying to figure out where America could get into a war. <laughs> at, at one point he writes to his bosom buddy, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, couldn't we somehow get Germany to burn some cities on the east coast of the US so then we could have an enemy? Um, he also had complete contempt for non-white peoples. He uh, epitomized uh, the racism of that age and believed that non-white peoples were completely incapable of self-government and needed to be guided by other people, which meant mainly himself. Um, Mark Twain was quite different. So Twain also traveled the world, but not to shoot animals. He traveled the world to meet people. 
And he went to places like India and South Africa where the face of European imperialism was quite brutal. He developed tremendous sympathy for the native peoples that, uh, that Roosevelt held in such contempt. He believed they should all be free and allowed to govern themselves. So in this sense, they, uh, they were great antagonists. On the other hand, they did have some things in common. So both of them were activists as well as writers and thinkers. Both were real prima donnas, too. They were massive egotists who essentially created themselves. They, they made up a persona for themselves, and then they filled that persona. And they could never turn away either one of them from a crowd or an interviewer or a mirror. <laughs> uh, they were acutely aware of each other's popularity, so they did not criticize each other in public. However, we know what they thought about each other from uh, their <laughs> private comments and letters. Uh, Mark Twain wrote that he considered Roosevelt clearly insane <laughs> <laughs> and the most formidable disaster that has befallen the country since the Civil War. <laughs> and Roosevelt returned the compliment by saying he would like to skin Mark Twain alive. <laughs> so, what were they arguing about? It was what one senator of that period called the greatest question that has ever been presented to the American people. He was right, it was, and it still is. It's the question of whether we should be projecting our military and coercive power onto other countries, or whether we should concentrate on building our own country and not try to shape the fate of others. To this day, this is the central question of our foreign policy. You can reduce all of our foreign policy questions down to that one, or even down to that one word, intervention. Where do we intervene? When? Under what circumstances? For what purpose? With what tools? We're still arguing about this. Uh, now, those of us that are interested in the questions of how America got to this place are always looking for the source. We are the country that intervenes more often in more other countries, further away from our own borders than any other country. So why is this? How did we get this way? When did it start? Often we look for the answers to those questions in the period after World War II. But actually, that's too late. It started earlier. The great debate over whether America should take this path happened in the period around 1898, 1899, 1900. Uh, as a person who has written a lot and read a lot and taught a lot about this period, I was always aware that it was this moment when the United States made its first push from, say, continental empire inside North America to overseas empire. But I had never understood that we didn't make this decision easily. It wasn't just automatic, as if we suddenly got to California and then we thought the next step should be some islands in the Pacific. The contrary was true. America erupted into an enormous debate about whether this was a good idea. Every major political and intellectual figure in America took part in this debate. It was on the front pages of newspapers, day after week after month. It riveted the country. And that's the central story of my book. This is an episode that's largely forgotten. All of my books are voyages of discovery. I'm always looking for some really big story that shaped world history, but that we don't know. Uh, the, a story that has, for whatever reason, fallen out of our history books. So my central discovery in this book is that this debate ever happened. I now see that it riveted the country. And the more I got into it, and the more I saw how broad-based and deep this debate was, the more I came to envy those people. Because the people at that period who were having this debate, including the senators who had the great uh, climactic debate in the winter of 1899, were debating the question that we don't debate anymore. Is this a good idea for the United States to be projecting its military power around the world? Or is this bad for us? We don't debate that anymore. Our only debate is 3,000 troops for the next Afghanistan surge or 5,000. That's the narrowness of our debate. 
We don't pull back and ask these great questions. And the story in my book is about people who did. That's why it's so relevant today. Every argument that was made during this debate on both sides, in favor of expansion and against it, are the arguments still being made today. There's no new ones. This debate in the history of American foreign policy is truly the mother of all debates. It all starts here. The only difference is that the senators were so much more articulate there. <laughs> <laughs> I read through these speeches after speeches in this long debate. I think I might have been the first person in 50 years to open that congressional record. And uh, <laughs> it's really impressive. The speeches are masterpieces of classical oratory with references to Pliny the Elder, <laughs> the Catiline Conspiracy, things you'd never dream of discussing with a US senator today. <laughs> so uh, for those of you that might have forgotten that one lesson you had back in high school about the Spanish-American War. Let me just refresh your memories and set the stage of the story that I'm telling. So uh, 1898 was probably the year when the United States changed more radically than any other year in its history. When that year started, we were happy within North America. We were at peace. Uh, within months, the whole country was in a frenzy of expansionism. So here's how that happened. Uh, a war is always considered great for news coverage. <laughs> and it so happened that in the spring of 1898, a new publisher had emerged on the New York scene. That was William Randolph Hearst, the founder of yellow journalism, what we now call fake news. <laughs> uh, Hearst had been given his newspaper by his father, who won it in a poker game. <laughs> Uh, he came to New York, he uh, took over the New York Journal, and started building up its circulation with stories about the usual, suicide, murder, adultery, corruption, children that get lost and fall down wells. After a while, however, with an entrepreneur's eye, Hearst came to realize that these stories start to sound the same. They, they, they become repetitive after a while. You need a running story to sell newspapers. And that's still a truism today, a story that's unfolding every day, not just the bridge fell in the river, it's a one-day story. And it's known in the news business to this day that war is the best running story of all. So Hearst came to the conclusion that if he could get the United States involved in any war, anywhere, uh, people would begin to buy his newspapers because he would then build up stories into heroism, treason, death, victory, valiance, courage, there's no limit to what creative journalists can do with even a tiny skirmish when men of your own country are in uniform. So Hearst quite consciously looked around for a war in which he could uh, foment American participation. Sure enough, he figured out quite quickly that there had been a war going on in Cuba for several years. Cuban patriots were trying to overthrow uh, Spanish rule. So, Hearst wanted to get the United States involved in this civil war in Cuba. How could he do that? He realized something that is still true today. And that is that Americans are very compassionate people. We hate the idea that anybody is suffering anywhere. And if you want us to go to war in some country, all you have to do is show us a picture of some poor suffering person that was brutalized because she wanted to go to school, and we'll think, we have to bomb that country. <laughs> uh, it works now, and it worked then. So Hearst came up with this idea that he would start publishing stories about the brutality of oppressive torture and evil that the Spanish were imposing in Cuba. And uh, those stories began running day after day. And having spent many hours cranking through the uh, microfilm uh, machines in the New York Public Library, I can tell you that many of those stories are quite effective. Even, even at this remove. I'm thinking of one story in particular. It takes a full page in the New York Journal about a holding pen that Spanish troops have erected in the countryside on some hill uh, where they're just throwing all the peasants that were found outside their protected village and they're not allowed to be. You throw them in this holding pen, it's directly under the hot sun. No sanitation, no food, and no water. 
as he's writing about the sufferings in this holding camp, the, the reporter actually, and this is all illustrated, he had a, uh, an artist, the reporter actually sees a young woman die in the holding pen. And then her, minutes later, her young baby dies. Later it turned out this reporter had never even been in Cuba. <laughs> but these stories had their impact. And Americans became very agitated at what was going on in Cuba. Uh, this thrilled Theodore Roosevelt, who was the great nation grabber, looking for a war anywhere. Uh, it also thrilled his partner in Washington, who was the third member of the imperialist triumvirate, if you will, Henry Cabot Lodge, who was sort of the Mephistopheles in Washington, organizing the whole imperial project. So, sure enough, uh, driven into a frenzy by this news reporting of the New York Journal and other newspapers, uh, the US Congress did decide to go to war in Cuba. We arrived there. Uh, it was a very short war. Many more people died in Florida of uh, malaria than ever died in Cuba. Um, we fought for about two half days. Um, Theodore Roosevelt uh, then decided that uh, those two half days of combat entitled him to the Medal of Honor. And he started writing letters to senators, and he never gave up, really, his whole life, talking about how he really deserved the Medal of Honor for what he had done. The generals, of course, had complete contempt for this. Here was a guy who was a volunteer soldier who fought for a couple of days uh, and won the Medal of Honor. By the way, he did get it when Bill Clinton was president. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, so, we got involved in this war in Cuba, the Spanish surrendered, and Cuba, Cuban revolutionaries had won. That's when the trouble began to start. As we were preparing to fight against the Spanish in Cuba, our naval strategists realized that Spain had a naval squadron, and that navy could attack the US mainland in reprisal, in retaliation for our attacks in Cuba. So we had to find the Spanish fleet and sink it. We had a lot of trouble finding it. It wasn't in Spain. It was nowhere near Cuba. We found it in a place that no American had ever heard of, the Philippine Islands. So sure enough, under orders from Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the Asiatic squadron of the US Navy was sent to the Philippines, and on May 1st, 1898, it destroyed the Spanish fleet. Suddenly, a whole new world opened to the eyes of some people like Henry Cabot Lodge, who wrote to Roosevelt, it took me 24 hours to understand the significance of what happened over there. And he began to realize, why give the Philippines over to the Filipinos? Maybe we should keep them. And how about Cuba, too? We began to decide that a war that began for the independence of Cuba could then be used for something completely different. It could make America an imperial power like France and England and Spain and Portugal and Holland and Belgium. We could begin taking colonies. This would be a first in the world, a country formerly a colony that became independent by throwing off foreign power, now seeks to impose its power on foreign countries. This idea thrilled many Americans. It horrified others. And that was the beginning of this great debate. An organization emerged called the Anti-Imperialist League, which had chapters all over America. It had hundreds of meetings. It published tens of thousands of brochures. It lobbied in Washington. The first anti-imperialist meeting in American history was held on June 15, 1898, in Faneuil Hall in Boston. Uh, let me just read you an, a, a section from that opening speech in which he predicts what might be happening, and ask yourself how true this came. This is from Reverend Charles Ames, who was a Unitarian theologian who had traveled the world on uh, uh, world peace-related projects. Here's what he says. The policy of imperialism threatens to change the temper of our people and to put us into a permanent attitude of arrogance, testiness, and defiance toward other nations. Once we enter the field of international conflict as a great military and naval power, we shall be one more bully among bullies. We shall only add one more to the list of oppressors of mankind. Now, President McKinley had to make this great decision. What do we do with the Philippines? 
and the other Spanish possessions, not just Cuba, there was also Puerto Rico. Guam was an island in the Pacific still under Spanish control. Um, there was this idea we could maybe just take one island of the Philippines instead of all 7,000. <laughs> uh, maybe we would just take Manila, or we just take a peninsula for a naval base. And others got this whole idea, we take the whole archipelago, it would be a great uh, springboard, and then we could take China from there. The ideas began to spread. Uh, McKinley uh, agonized. McKinley was not a decisive person. He always wanted to follow public opinion. In fact, the Speaker of the House then uh, cracked that McKinley keeps his ear so close to the ground that it's full of grasshoppers. <laughs> uh, one night in October of 1898, McKinley, who was a very religious man, <coughs> walked by his own account through the corridors of the White House, and he got down on his knees in the darkness, and he had a message from God. He later explained this. It was certainly the most influential divine visitation in uh, recorded presidential history. Uh, God told President McKinley he should take all the islands and uh, raise them up and Christianize them. The Philippines had been a Spanish colony for several hundred years and was largely Catholic already. Um, that slipped out of the conversation. In any case, during that visitation, God sounded quite a bit like Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge. <laughs> As a result of what, uh, what transpired there, uh, President McKinley did announce that he would order his diplomats in Europe to impose on Spain a treaty by which they would have to surrender all their territories to us. That set off the great debate because that treaty had to be ratified by the U.S. Senate. The, the months leading up to this debate, as I said, were full of newspaper editorials and articles uh, by all the leading figures in America. The lineup in the Anti-Imperialist League was truly remarkable. George Boutwell, the former governor of Massachusetts and co-founder of the Republican Party, former Attorney General of the United States, was the uh, president. The vice presidents included William Jennings Bryan, the leader of the Democratic Party, um, Andrew Carnegie, the richest man in America, a fierce anti-imperialist, uh, plus people you wouldn't associate with uh, Andrew Carnegie, like great social reformers, Jane Addams, Samuel Gompers, Booker T. Washington. These were all outspoken anti-imperialists. And of course, uh, last but not least, Mark Twain. Twain was quite vituperative uh, and uh, became quite the thorn in the imperial side. Uh, at the beginning of February 1899, the Senate convened for this debate. The Senate debated for 32 days without a break. The speeches, as I said, are brilliant. Even the bad guys were brilliant. <laughs> Uh, these speeches were intensely reported around the country. In many newspapers, published the entire texts of that day's speeches. Uh, it meant that Americans had a great opportunity to educate themselves on these issues. Is it a good idea for us to become a world imperial power, or is it a bad idea? It's the debate that we're not having. Reading those speeches and those articles really made me wish that I could just reprint them and. Uh, put them in today's papers, but nobody would believe that a U.S. Senator could speak that way. <laughs> uh, so, the debate was not only followed by Americans, but every foreign ambassador in Washington was sending back reports every day on how many senators on this side, how many senators on the other side. Everyone understood that the outcome of this debate was going to affect not only the future of the United States, but the future of the entire world. And the U.S. Senators were completely aware of that as well. Uh, so this debate crystallizes the great issues uh, that faced and do face America. Uh, let me just read you a couple of samples uh, to show you uh, how these arguments were formulated. Uh, here is one of the main arguments presented uh, to persuade people that our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence forbid us from being an expansionist power. 
So even the, even the names of the senators were more impressive then. This is Senator Augustus Octavio Bacon, <laughs> Georgia. I won't do it in the southern accent, but try to imagine. <clears throat> for, ev for over 100 years, every lover of liberty has pointed to this sentence. All just powers of government are derived from the consent of the governed. This sentence has been a pillar of fire by night to the downtrodden and oppressed around the world. <laughs> no, Mr. President, we will not change that sentence now. Not liberty, Mr. President, for your family as I prescribe it. Not Spanish liberty for Cuba, not English liberty for the United States. I am not American liberty for the Philippines, but universal liberty for which our fathers died. Immediately jumps up the young imperial senator from Indiana, Albert Beveridge. The opposition tells us that we ought not to govern a people without their consent. I answer, the rule of liberty, that all just government derives its authority from the consent of the government, applies only to those who are capable of self-government. <laughs> By which, of course, he means white people. Uh, President McKinley also had to uh, Square this odd geopolitical circle. How do you sell to the American people the idea that American soldiers should be sent to a foreign country to shoot down people who honestly believe they're fighting for their own country's freedom? That had never happened in American history. And McKinley came to Boston to try to solve that dilemma. Here's how he explained it. Did we need their consent to perform a great act for humanity? We had it in every aspiration of their minds, in every hope of their hearts. In other words, he's saying something we still hear today. The rest of the world really needs our help. And the places that really need our intervention are the places where the people are so backward, they don't even know they need our help. <laughs> uh, here is another... Uh, another argument that came up in that debate that I think you still hear today. This is Henry Cabot Lodge. I do not believe that this nation was raised up for nothing. I have faith that it has a great mission in the world, a mission of good, a mission of freedom. I believe it can live up to that mission and therefore I want to see it step forward boldly and take its place at the head of nations. We are still hearing this argument today. It's our mission. It's our role in the world. We have to go out there and do this. But that didn't satisfy the other Republican senator from Massachusetts, George Frisbee Hoare, who took the opposite view of Lodge. He jumped up and replied, you have no right at the cannon's mouth to impose on an unwilling people your declaration of independence and your constitution and your notions of freedom and what is good. This is still the counter-argument you hear today. Actually, we don't know what's better for the world than the world itself knows. So this argument, as I said, went on for 32 days. And it really is sobering to realize how far down you know, we've come in the quality of debate, even though that's pretty evident. Uh, the final vote was to ratify that treaty with a margin of one vote more than the required two-thirds majority. It was one vote that turned the U.S. in this direction from which we had never retreated. The anti-imperialists then took this case to the U.S. Supreme Court. They argued uh, the Constitution specifically says that the U.S. government has no powers other than the powers specifically given to it in this document. And there's nothing in that document that says that the U.S. has the power to send troops abroad. The Supreme Court rejected that argument by a vote of five to four. One vote. So with that, the imperial project proceeded. The Philippine War turned out to be extremely brutal. Uh, over 200,000 people left dead by our intervention there. Uh, it's a war that Americans, for obvious reasons, have completely forgotten. We don't even know this war ever happened. Needless to say, Asians and Filipinos in particular are, are, are quite acutely aware of it. Uh, it's another example of how we forget our interventions, but they fester and burn in the hearts and minds and souls of the people in the target countries. Uh, 
I do think that the anti-imperialists uh, had an effect. Uh, we never annexed countries again. At that time, we were taking countries, just made them part of the United States. Like the Philippines was a U.S. colony until after World War II. Puerto Rico it still is, and Guam. We didn't do that anymore. We stopped doing that. We, we developed new ways of influencing countries, and new kinds of colonialism. We didn't do the kind that the Europeans did. Um, in the last chapter of my book, I take the argument over the debate between intervention and anti-intervention all the way up to the present day. I, I take you through the 20th century, show how some presidents were more interventionist, some less interventionist. And I was quite surprised, actually, to find out who turns out to be the most anti-imperialist president of the 20th century. But I'm not going to tell you who it is, because then you might not buy the book. <laughs> uh, it's a surprise, though. Uh, so I mentioned to you that all of my books are voyages of discovery. Uh, my great discovery in this book is that this debate ever happened. I feel like I've rescued this uh, very important episode from historical oblivion. Um, but as often happens when you uh, write books, you, you make other discoveries along the way. One of them for me was certainly Mark Twain. I now realize that uh, I had a very partial uh, view of Mark Twain. For me, Mark Twain was Mr. Nice Guy. Everybody loved him. He rocked on his front porch, he had those white locks, he told funny stories, and never offended a soul. That was not true. Mark Twain was bitter in his anti-imperialism. Uh, he wrote that Americans fighting in foreign wars were carrying a bandit's musket under a polluted flag. And he even wanted to change the flag of the United States to replace the stars with skull and crossbow symbols. <laughs> At one point, Twain was asked to introduce, uh, to be one of the Toastmasters for uh, a dinner where Winston Churchill was the uh, main attraction. And all of the previous Toastmasters spoke on the same theme, which was Britain and America, how much we have in common and our heritage and how much we love each other. And Twain, who was the final Toastmaster, got up and said, uh, I agree with everything that had been said, and since he had seen what the Americans were doing in the Philippines, and he'd been to South Africa, seen what the British were doing there, he turned to Winston Churchill and he said, I truly do believe we are kin in sin. <laughs> Here's a little piece that he wrote after the uh, passage of the Treaty of Paris that turned us into an imperial power. Ask yourself if this came true or could be written today. It was impossible to save the great republic. She was rotten to the heart. <laughs> Lust of conquest had long ago done its work. Trampling upon the helpless abroad had taught her, by natural process, to endure with apathy and the like at home. The government was irrevocably in the hands of the prodigiously rich and their hangers-on. The suffrage was become a mere machine, which they used as they chose. There was no principle but commercialism, no patriotism but of the pocket. That was 120 years ago, excuse me. Uh, the final big discovery I made in uh, writing this book was of a person that I had never heard of. Uh, and I was embarrassed to realize that a person of this scope would be someone that, whose name I would never have found. But I've now realized that nobody else has ever heard of him either, so I feel a little better. Anybody know this name, Carl Schurz? One, two. What, what do you know about him? Uh, is he in New York? Uh, Park. 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 Park! You know, I spoke at the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan, and uh, I said, anybody ever hear of Carl Schurz? And to my shock! Everybody raised their hand. And I said, what? And I said, what do you know about him? And they all said the same thing. Oh, that's the park outside Gracie Mansion, Carl Schurz Park. <laughs> then I said, does anybody know anything about Carl Schurz other than that he has a park named after him? No. <laughs> that made me feel better. <laughs> Carl Schurz was one of the uh, most impressive immigrants to come to the United States in the 19th century. He was a fascinating figure. So as a teenager, he fought in the 1848 revolution in Germany where he was born. He had to flee after breaking his comrade out of prison, very romantic story, came to America, very young man, became a passionate abolitionist, um, became a general in the Civil War. Uh, he fought at Gettysburg, he led troops at Bull Run. Um, then after the Civil War, he became the first German-born U.S. Senator 
from Missouri. Later, he became Secretary of the Interior, one of the founders of the National Park System. In the late 19th century, he was the leading advocate for good government and civic reform in the United States. He would have been known to all Americans at that time. Uh, his figure, his face was very uh, noticeable. He had this curly black beard that cartoonists loved. I have a photo of him in my book, but also I also have a cartoon that was published uh, with him in it, and everybody at that time would have recognized him. The cartoon, uh, I'm going to give this one away, uh, even for those that don't buy the book. Uh, the cartoon shows President McKinley in a tailor store, and he's grossly obese, and he's being fitted with a suit that's the American flag, and on the stripes are all the countries we're taking over. It says Guam, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Philippines, and the tailor is feeding him more and more. And there's Carl Schurz holding up a spoon to McKinley, and Schurz says, Try some of this get thin medicine, Mr. President. <laughs> and McKinley replies, No thanks, Sonny. I never did like any of that stuff. <laughs> so Carl Schurz was one of the most articulate leaders of uh, the anti-imperialist movement. Mark Twain was actually out of the country when this debate began. And when he arrived in New York, his first decision was, I got to go see Carl Schurz. Uh, he later wrote, using the uh, vernacular of the riverboat captain, I. I dropped into his wake and followed with perfect confidence. So Schertz was sort of the mentor of Mark Twain in the anti-imperialist uh, area. I chose the title of my book, The True Flag, from a speech given by Carl Schertz. So February 2nd, 1899 uh, was the date that President McKinley submitted that Treaty of Paris to the Senate, setting off that epochal 32-day debate. On that same day, by coincidence, Carl Schurz was delivering the convocation address at the University of Chicago. He was there to address the great issue of the day. And he did so with an 11,000-word speech in which he eviscerated the whole imperial idea. He listed all the arguments for expansion, religious, political, strategic, humanitarian, commercial, and demolished all of them. Uh, I'm not going to do the whole 11,000 words this time, <laughs> but here's a little sampling. And this is the passage from which I chose the title of my book, and it shows how contemporary the sentiments expressed in that period are. This is a clarion call for 1899, but it's really a clarion call for 2017. Carl Schurz. Let us raise high the flag of our country, not as an emblem of reckless adventure and greedy conquest, of betrayed professions and broken pledges, of criminal aggressions and arbitrary rule over subject populations, but the old, the true flag, the flag of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, the flag of the government of, for, and by the people. The flag of national faith held sacred and of national honor unsullied. The flag of human rights and of good example to all nations. The flag of true civilization, peace, and goodwill to all men. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to take a few questions. Let me just say before that uh, what a thrill it is to be here. Um, this is where I grew up. Uh, I'm a Toronto Central School graduate. Uh, and I have brought my granddaughter to go to school in the same school that I went to. So uh, it's really an amazing service. Uh, so it's great to be in this building, great to be on this hill, and um, it's wonderful to be with all my neighbors. It's a very special night for me. So with that, I'm happy to uh, bloviate a little longer. So when you go back to that debate, that 32-day debate, before they voted for expansion or non-expansion, is that vote taken on political lines or party lines or? Very good question. Uh, was it a party line vote? Actually, no. Um, 
most Republicans favored the expansionist uh, approach, but not all. I, I gave you that uh, battle between Henry Cabot Lodge and George Frisbee Hoare. They were both Republicans. Um, Democrats were also split. Um, but uh, an there was an interesting aspect to the, uh, many Democrats in the, uh, in the North favored, uh, favored the anti-imperialist cause, but it was especially strong among Democrats from the South. Now, racism was a, a very strong force in American life in those days. Remember Theodore Roosevelt, I wouldn't say that every, that the only good Indian is a dead Indian, but I think nine out of ten are, and I wouldn't inquire too carefully after the ten. <laughs> that was a widespread attitude in America. Now, um, it was logical that the imperialists would use racism as part of their argument, because they were saying these people are too dumb, they can't govern themselves, so we have to do it for them. But what's more interesting is that some of the anti-imperialists were also racist, including those southern senators like Pen Pitchfork Ben Tillman, who were working hard to uh, suppress African-American rights, but they were also anti-imperialists because they feared that once we start taking over countries where people who aren't white live, those people will come into our country and they will vitiate our blood. So it was an odd combination. It was not on party lines. Some of it was on deep conviction, uh, others for other uh, issue reasons, and then there were personal reasons. Several senators received, uh, we now know this word, thanks to what's happening in Washington today, emoluments. <laughs> uh, one senator became a federal judge after voting for the treaty. Uh, another one was, uh, his, gave his vote for the uh, right to name one of his friends as a federal judge. A third got something even better for a US senator, he got to name all the postmasters in his home state. Wow. <laughs> so several of these votes were purchased through uh, traditional Washington methods. Uh, it was not a party line vote. I like to think it was purely ideological, but it wasn't even that either. <coughs> mm -hmm. Could the idea of manifest destiny in the 1840s have been a precursor of American imperialism? Absolutely, yes. Uh, the, the question was manifest destiny. Did it play a role in creating this mentality? Um, I think you can divide the history of uh, American empire into three historical sections. The first was when we created continental empire. That is, we cleared the native peoples, we took over half of Mexico, and we established what we were told was our manifest destiny to rule North America from one ocean to the other. Then, starting in the period I'm writing about, after the treaty that was uh, ratified in 1899, we became an overseas empire. We started taking non-contiguous territories. And then, after World War II, we became a truly global empire. Uh, so, when we reached the shores of California, it was figuratively speaking, in 1890, that was when the uh, US Census Bureau uh, officially ruled that the frontier was closed. No more room to expand inside North America. Uh, what do we do now? We, we've been expanding more or less ever since the pilgrims moved out of Plymouth. It somehow seems un-American for us ever to say, well, I think we're satisfied. I think we've got enough. You always want more. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a real imperial temptation. You know, I, I lived in Turkey for some years and uh, I will now reduce the entire history of the Ottoman Empire down to one sentence. Uh, the first half of Ottoman power was a period when they were expanding and winning wars and taking over territories. And the second half of Ottoman power was when they were losing wars and getting smaller. That's the way empires go. I think the Ottoman Empire had about 14 years of peace in about 500 years. That's what they did. In the winter they would plan what country they were going to attack next. And that was what empires always did. But we weren't supposed to be an empire like that. We were supposed to be something new in the world. And the temptation to emulate uh, the European powers just proved too great for us to carry through the idea that we could create something new in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where does the prevailing, overwhelmingly isolationist attitudes of the 20s and 30s fit into this story? Um, 
it's a very interesting period uh, because I think World War I was a big shock to Americans. Um, and we elected a series of conservative Republican presidents who were real conservatives in foreign affairs. They didn't want America to get involved in wars. We brought home our troops from Haiti. We brought home the troops that were fighting Sandino in Nicaragua. Um, presidents uh, like uh, Herbert Hoover, for example, refused to uh, intervene on behalf of American companies that had problems in foreign countries. He said it wasn't the business of the US, which no American president would dare say now. Um, so I think there was a sense that we were suckered into a European war once and it should never happen again, to quote uh, Ernest Hemingway. The question of World War I is one that can be eternally debated. You know, some people will argue now that if we had not gotten into World War I, it would have gone on a couple of more years and there would have been a more equitable settlement. We, instead, we came in, one side was the total winner, the other side was the total loser. And the total loser side never accepted being told that they were the total loser. That was Germany. World War I is the founding catastrophe of our world. Without World War I, there's no Russian Revolution, no communism. In Russia, no Nazism, no Hitler, no Holocaust. So uh, I think World War I is still a, an, an issue that uh, grabs those of us who look back over history. And I think it definitely shaped people's uh, sense that we should pull back and not, become, not involve ourselves in foreign wars. World War II changed that, of course. Uh, but I, I do think there's something particular about World War II that always uh, rivets my attention. You know, the, the flood of material about World War II is unending. The movies, the books, the TV shows, the magazines, the video games, it just never stops. In a month, it would produce enough to fill this room. Why is that? So was World War II a hugely important episode? Of course. Did it shape the modern world? Yes. But I think there's another reason. Why we love World War II? It's because World War II shows us the way we like to think that we are. We went into countries that were under horrific tyrannies. We liberated them and we went home and they were democracies. But we forgot all the other times and we did the opposite. So uh, rather than think about what we did in Guatemala, Indonesia, the Congo, Cuba, Nicaragua, Iraq, Vietnam, we like to think about World War II, and that's one that always comes up again. So uh, I do think that uh, both of those wars produced a mentality that was used by people in power to push us to do things that really didn't have anything to do with those world conflicts. Yes? You, you spend a little time talking about Twain and his observations and really his humor. He was really good at sizing people up. And he did that throughout his career. He did it with a few presidents. And he obviously went after Roosevelt you know, for the research that you've done. Is there, is there any indication that, uh, that when, Twain, when Twain was you know, talking or, or, or expressing his opinion on this, that he was actually passing along his feelings to Roosevelt either privately or he knew that Roosevelt would find out what he really thought about it. Because that was the case in some other presidents as well. I'm just curious. Uh, no doubt, uh, each of them knew exactly what they thought of each other and what they said privately about each other. I even found out that Mark Twain rented a house in uh, up, uh, uptown New York City, and uh, it was the house that Theodore Roosevelt spent several summers in as a little boy. Uh, so they knew each other from New York. They were in the same circles. Um, they definitely were aware of each other's disdain. Uh, However, I did find a note that later on, after this episode had passed, Roosevelt was president, um, a bill came up before Congress uh, about co copyright protection for authors. And Mark Twain went to the White House and had a dinner with Roosevelt, and it was quite friendly, so I guess they left the treaty debate behind. <laughs> it's nice to think there was a time when we could do that. Yeah, I don't quite know how to phrase the question, but I'm thinking about the role of capitalism in this great debate about um, that you're talking about and when you feel it began. And so the question was about the role of capitalism. It's very, very important. And, and it's, I can give you a specific answer. It wasn't just the general idea that capitalism needs to expand. There was something quite specific. And I can tell you this because I spent so much time reading the newspapers of the 1890s, which is 
maybe not a fun hobby I want to recommend to everybody, <laughs> but it does have its value. So uh, one theme you see coming up over and over in magazines and newspapers and politicians' speeches is what was then called glut. Glut was a big thing in those days. What glut meant was the factories and the farms in the United States had so fully mastered techniques of mass production that they were producing more food and more goods than Americans could consume. And this was causing trouble inside the United States. That's what caused great bankruptcies of farmers. It caused labor riots. We had Pinkertons shooting down strikers on the streets. This was caused by social problems. And we realized we need to export these social problems. We can't, we can't sustain them here at home. And the constant cry in these articles, the ending point of all these articles is we've got to have foreign markets. We've got to be able to sell our stuff somewhere else. I asked my students, so why didn't they want to sell their stuff in Europe? And you all know the answer. It's because Europe was all protected by tariffs. You couldn't, you couldn't sell your stuff there. Why couldn't you sell it in other colonies? Because those colonies were all established to have commerce only with the mother country. So our idea was, if we could get a big country that could be a market for us, that would be the safety valve. Get all our excess production uh, off of our streets, off of our farms, off of our shelves. And it wasn't just the Philippines. There's, there were a lot of articles about the developing market in the Philippines. People will get richer. They'll want to buy more stuff. But it went further than that. Behind this, there was the great phantasm of the China market. This was considered the ultimate dream for Americans. There were articles all the time about, so how much beef would the Chinese buy if we could get them to start eating beef instead of eating rice and vegetables? <laughs> Suppose they would start building with nails. How many nails could China consume? What if they would uh, wear clothing made of cotton? How much cotton could we sell in China? The Philippines were seen as a springboard to the China market. So uh, no doubt about it, uh, capitalist, the capitalist push was decisive, and it illustrates a, another truism about the role of econ economics in American foreign policy. It's not true, as you sometimes hear, that commerce follows the flag. It's the other way around. The flag follows commerce. First, the commercial interests get involved in a country. Then they get in trouble with the local government because they're not obeying laws or they're committing various depredations. Then they appeal to American government for help. Then comes the flag. So commerce is the first thing that pulls us into these disputes. And without that argument, I don't think uh, the Philippine uh, Treaty would have been approved. OK, one more. In the current administration, there's um, a idea that we should be more isolated, isolationism. What do you think parameters are of that in the current world where we've become so much more global, both economy, weather, so many other um, life functions, economies? In the world of, in, in the field of semantics, the people on my side definitely lost the argument. So we're isolationists. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes isolationists. Mm -hmm. The people on the other side are liberal interventionists. They're globalists. They want humanitarian intervention. It sounds so good. We, we lost out in terminology. So I like to say that we're not uh, isolationist. We are following, we're advocating for a more prudent, restrained foreign policy. So asking about the Trump administration, uh, that was the one thing that intrigued me about Trump during the political campaign. He made speeches in which he said we shouldn't be involved in overthrowing governments. And we spent $2 trillion in the Middle East and we didn't get anything for it. We shouldn't be wasting our money like that. So now I'm thinking, dude, where's my truck? <laughs> it's amazing to me how powerful this force is that brings everybody in Washington into the liberal, conservative, democratic, republican consensus on foreign policy. In Washington, there's no percentage for saying America should do any less in the world. It should always do more, always more. Um, and original thinking in foreign policies treated like the virus of a horrific plague that must be stamped out before it can infect, infect the entire policy process. So I would like to see the US uh, take a more realistic view of the world and uh, intervene only uh, 
much more rarely than we do. But I don't, I don't see that we're changing. So let me conclude with this observation. I started it by saying that intervention is the great question of our foreign policy. When do we do it? Uh, so in my business, the business of trying to analyze world affairs, uh, this is almost a parlor game to come up with your own list. We should intervene when the following criteria are met. We don't actually carry around our own index cards with our own lists, but it's something like that. Um, we're more interesting than accountants, but we do have our boring moments. Uh, so, I'm, so under what circumstances should the United States send its military to other parts of the world? That's going to happen. America, by its nature, is always going to be an intervening power. It doesn't have to intervene militarily all the time. But even military intervention will be necessary at some point. So when are those points? As I said, everybody has their own list. I like one that was drawn up by Colin Powell. Unfortunately, he drew this up after the Iraq debacle. <laughs> so he said the US should send its troops into a foreign war if four conditions are met. Number one, a vital interest of the United States is at stake. Number two, there is no non-military way to achieve this goal. Number three, there is a clear strategy and an exit strategy. And number four, the American people support this intervention. That's a pretty high bar, but I could support it. And I think it's a, very important for Americans to reflect on these questions. I want to try to stimulate some version of the debate that we had in 1899 and try to pull back from the narrower questions about how many troops on the next Afghan surge and ask us these deeper questions about whether we really serve our own interests and the interests of world peace by our military interventions or whether there are some lessons to be learned uh, from our illustrious predecessors. On that happy note, I'm going to go back and sign a couple of books. Thanks so much. busy on your next book and you'll be back here next yeah. summer time. <laughs> Thank you all. Take more than one summer. <laughs>